Welcome to Understanding the Book of Revelation as Narrative, Lesson 7. My name is Steve Meeker. This lesson covers Revelation chapters 12 and 13, A War in Heaven, and The Two Beasts. Now, if you haven't listened to the first six lessons in this series, I recommend that you go back and listen to them in order because there are some details that are covered there that are important in helping your understanding of this lesson. The main reference for this study is a book called The Revelation of John, a narrative commentary by Dr. James L. Resigy. I've looked at several books uh, in preparing this class in this study. Uh, a lot of fine books on Revelation, but this one to me was outstanding. It uh, it spoke to me more than any other one that I had um, seen. I think part of the reasons for that is, uh, first of all, Dr. Resigy has a, a doctorate in theology, but he's also extremely knowledgeable about literature. And he was able to pinpoint areas of the writing of Revelation that I've never seen anybody else do. And I think they're, they're very relevant in, uh, in our helping us with our understanding and appreciation of this beautiful book. And so I recommend that you get it for your library. But I'll give you a warning. Uh, this is the most, uh, probably the most scholarly book I've ever held in my hands. It is um, extensive in the references and footnotes. Uh, and um, you're not just going to sit down and breeze through it. So um, I'll tell you, it took me uh, probably several months to actually read through it. I could kind of handle about two paragraphs at a time and let those soak in before I went on further. But that's where we've developed this study from. And I'm excited to say that Dr. Resigy has collaborated with me on developing a study guide for this class that you can print. Uh, it's called Understanding the Book of Revelation as Narrative. And you can find it at www.academia.edu, either under Dr. Resigy's name or mine. I have used this little uh, illustration uh, in previous lessons to show that Revelation is different from other books. It doesn't just proceed in a straight line chronologically from start to end like most of the other books of the Bible. And chapter 12 is one that certainly does not fall in line chronologically. In fact, it appears to, at least parts of chapter 12, appears to have taken place before humans were even on the earth. And so for that reason, it's kind of helpful to keep this in mind that Revelation jumps around in time and it jumps around in space. I especially like chapter 12 because I think it clarifies the nature of the spiritual warfare that we find ourselves in. Uh, here are a couple of quotes from Dr. Resigy's book. The conflict between good and evil, God and Satan, Christ and counterfeit Christ intensifies in chapter 12 and 13. Despite what seemed like the end in chapter 11, the story continues. Chapter 12 follows an A-B-A -A pattern with two interrelated conflicts. Parts one and three describe the strife between the dragon, identified as Satan in verse nine, and an unnamed woman. Part two tells of the war between Michael and the archangel and the dragon. Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried in pain as she was about to give birth. It's interesting how this first a few words of chapter 12 began. It says, a great sign appeared in heaven. In verse 3, we're going to see Satan introduced with just the smaller introduction, another sign. So John's throwing shade at Satan there. It's kind of fun. The woman's outer garments characterize her inner traits. 
She is a celestial queen. She wears a crown of 12 stars, the significant number of completeness associated with God's people. Contrast this woman with the whore of Babylon, who appears in chapter 17. This woman nurtures the people of God, while her satanic parody persecutes the people of God. Although the woman rules the heavens, her home is on the earth. She lives in the wilderness, where she is protected. A uh, couple of further ideas on this. They're not on the screen. But from a heavenly perspective, she is a transcendent queen of splendor. But from the earthly or below point of view, she lives at the margins of society and is vulnerable to the dragon. In verse 2, she cries out in birth pangs, a metaphor for the woes of the messianic age. The same word for torment here was used back in chapter 9, verse 5 to describe the torment caused by the locust scorpion-like stings. Okay, so who is this woman? Well, many have expressed differing opinions about who the woman is. However, verse 17 says the rest of her children are described as those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Most likely, then, this woman is an image of God's people, both Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church. God's people are persecuted by the dragon and subject to distress and travail, yet protected by God. Like the woman, Christians are victorious with a home in heaven, and yet we live in the wilderness on our sojourn through this earth. Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. So even though we saw the beast briefly in chapter 11, we have a more formal introduction here. In contrast to the woman's brilliant appearance, the dragon is the color of blood. The epitaph great identifies the dragon as a member of the partnership of destructive characters or evil places. We're going to see the great whore, the great beast, and Babylon the great. He has seven heads with seven diadems indicating that his power is formidable However, he's no match for the Lamb, who is described as having many diadems in chapter 19. With his tail, he sweeps down a third of the stars from heaven and hurls them to the earth. This is likely a reference to angels, as Satan convinces a third of the angels to join forces with him. Bad choice, angels. Those angels will be now called demons. These are the angels mentioned in chapter 12, verse 7. We'll see them again in just a few minutes. Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Notice that phrase, the rod of iron. He will rule all nations with the rod of iron. If you'll recall back in lesson 2, one of the letters, in fact, in chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 27, the letter to Thyatira, those who conquered there were promised to rule with him with a rod of iron. And so that's a reference again here to Christ's ruling authority. In verse 5, the dragon attempts to devour the woman's child, but the son is given safe passage to God's throne. The passive voice, snatched away, indicates that once again, God is the hidden actor in the scene. Although God seems to be absent, he is actively present in day-to-day -day events. He places limits on evil's reach and gives protection and nourishment to the church. He provides safe sanctuary to both the male child and the woman. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God 
so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. The woman's place on earth, the wilderness, is a place prepared by God where she is nourished just as the Israelites were on their exodus. In contrast to the great city Babylon, which is the spiritual home for those who follow the beast, the wilderness is the spiritual home for the believing community. Christians inevitably must travel in the city of this world, but their home is not the great city, rather the wilderness, the margins of society, the place of spiritual detachment from the attachments of Babylon is where Christians dwell. The wilderness represents the anti-society, our counterculture to Babylon and the beast. I want you to think about your local church. Hopefully you are attending a, a good uh, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. But the main body of the world doesn't pass through your church, most likely. Even the main body of your community probably does not. It's a place where you go to separate from the world, to separate from the cultures and values of the dominant culture. It's a place where you go to be refreshed, to have your soul and your spirit refreshed by good preaching, good music, good fellowship. That's where we go, the margins. That's where Christians are refreshed. Now we saw this time period, 1,260 days in the last chapter, in chapter 11, the sign of the woman in Revelation 12 parallels the image of the two witnesses in Revelation 11. In both the church, people of God, for 1,260 days, carry out their specific role as witnesses for God. During this time, they are protected and nourished by God in the midst of chaos and evil. And we talked in the previous lesson about 1,260 days is another way of saying three and a half years. This is equal to the time that the beast ruled, which was noted in chapter 11, verse 2, and will also be in chapter 13, verse 5, although in those places it says 42 months. I'll explain why in a little bit. The equal time period is symbolic of showing that there is no imbalance between persecution and protection. Evil does not have the upper hand, despite appearances. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his, his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And so the battle between the dragon and the woman is now interrupted by a violent clash between the dragon and his angels and Michael and his angels. Three times in verse 7 we find the word war, and then once again in verse 17. Four times between verses 9 and 13 we see the words thrown down, reiterating Satan's defeat. Michael and his two-third were more than powerful enough to overpower Satan and his one-third. The aftermath of this battle still carries on today. Jesus reported seeing this event. This was from Luke 10, 18, and 19. He said, quote, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Look, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and on scorpions and on the full force of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. That's a great verse to put up on your refrigerator. Uh, I've got it on mine, I believe. Certainly have it memorized. Uh, that's certainly a one that you want to go to when you're praying, when you're fighting, uh, when in spiritual battles. Uh, oh yeah, I want to talk about that that uh, thrown down business. This was a, this was an epic smackdown. Uh, I mean, WWE has nothing on what we see here. Um, I've heard people refer to this as the fall of Satan. No, it was more than a fall. 
uh, did a little research. You see things in our atmosphere fall at 32 feet per second. But Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning. Lightning travels 61 miles per second. So this was an epic smackdown when Satan got himself thrown down from heaven. In verse 8, it mentions that a place is no longer found for Satan in heaven. Without his place, Satan loses his right to be an accuser. This is the only place in the New Testament where this judicial term is used. It appears in the Old Testament in Job and in Zechariah. The victory proclamation in verse 10 announces that the accuser is now disbarred from his practice and kicked out of heaven. I love this verse from Romans, and I think it applies also to spiritual warfare. Who are you to try to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Even though Satan no longer has a right to be your accuser, he still tries. He will still tell you that you're a failure. He will still tell you that you're a loser. He will still bring up all things to your memory of things that you've done in the past. He does not have the right. You do not have to allow him to do that. Folks, I really want you to understand the power in prayer in dealing with spiritual warfare. If we can tap into that power, as we were seeing the last chapter of the two witnesses, if we can tap into the power as they did, you don't have to uh, put up with any of his accusations. You can tell him where to go. And that verse in Romans says, to his own master he stands or falls. We, we, we answer only to God. We do not have to answer to Satan. So who are you to judge the servant of another? Tell him that. Tell him directly when he comes to you with, your, with those accusations. You don't have to listen to any of that. In verse 9, we see all the different names of Satan. The piling up of names and epitaphs in verse 9 identifies the primary traits of the dragon. He is that ancient serpent, a reference to Genesis 3. He's also the deceiver of the whole world, a definitive trait of the dragon and other evil characters. The names devil and Satan can also be defined as slanderer. What is a slanderer? It's someone who tells lies intentionally to ruin your name and reputation. Once again, you don't have to put up with him. You have power in the name of Jesus to stop him. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. And another instance of where John hears something that describes or interprets what he sees occurs in verses 10 and 11. A loud voice directs our attention to an important message. Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the ruling authority of his Christ. The spiritual reality of the war between Michael and Satan is the victory achieved on the cross. The first part of the announcement proclaimed God's victory and the arrival of a new period in salvation history. The key word now signals a major turning point in historic events. We see another trait of Satan here in that he accuses the brothers and sisters day and night. Even though he no longer has the right to, he, is, he still tries. So how do you overcome that? Our ability to overcome the enemy is linked to two things. First, the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, and second, the word of our testimony. The blood of Jesus is our covering. It's our power. It's our strength. Without it, we are incapable of being overcomers. However, 
we also have a part to play in overcoming the enemy. The word of our testimony is a powerful weapon that is never to be underestimated. Another word for the word of your testimony is your prayers. Your prayers and your explanation of things that God has done for you. These two elements combine to empower us to overcome. It's no accident that this reference is placed here, marking the defeat of Satan. Dr. Resigi quotes another author in his book named G.B. Caird and gives kind of a war room analogy. He says, Michael is the staff officer in the heavenly control room who removes Satan's flag from the battle map. Christ is the field officer who wins the victory through his death on the cross. The victory has been won, and Christians add to that victory by their faithful testimony, even unto death. That's a nice quote, nice way of putting it. Revelation 12:12. 12, 12. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. The woe on both the earth and the sea anticipates Satan's two accomplices, the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth, which will appear in chapter 13. We've already seen two woes. You remember the eagle that came out in chapter 9? That was the first one, and then there was a second woe that came in chapter 11. Uh, verse 14. So now we have the third woe, even though it's not numbered in the text, it is announced in verse 12, after the falling of Satan to the earth. The first two woes were directed against the earth dwellers who rebel against God. However, the third woe may also impact Christians as we encounter spiritual warfare on a daily basis. Satan time is indeed short. It is the plot time between his defeat by Christ on the cross and the, his ultimate fate at the end of time. Revelation 12, verse 13 and 14, And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman, so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. The conflict between good and evil intensifies on earth. The woman, an image of the church, sets out on a wilderness journey that recalls Israel's exodus. Just as the Israelites escaped from the Egyptians on eagle's wings, a reference from Exodus 4, uh, 19 verse 4, the woman was given two wings of a giant eagle to flee the pursuing Pharaoh of this story in verse 14. There's yet another correlation between Revelation and Exodus. Well, we've already seen 1260 days and 42 months as a way of referencing three and a half years. Here's another way, time, times, and half a time. As the Israelites were nourished with manna, quail and water, the woman is nourished for a time, times, and half a time. John uses this phrase to represent 1260 days, or three and a half years. The same phrase is found twice in the book of Daniel. Three and a half years represents a divinely restricted period of persecution, but there is more to it than that. The repetitious phrase establishes a cadence that is abruptly and suddenly interrupted. We are expecting one, two, three, but what we get is one, two, one half. From below, it might appear that evil will run on unchecked, but suddenly its reign is halted. Unlike the number seven, three and a half does not represent a total. Revelation 12, verses 15 and 16. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth, after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river, which the dragon poured out of his mouth. 
In verse 15, the dragon pours from his mouth a destructive flooding river designed to suffocate the woman. Contrast this river with the river which flows from the throne of God and the Lamb. Death and destruction characterize the serpent's river, while the river of God is teeming with life. We'll read more about this one in chapter 22. Evil brings chaos and destruction, whereas God's rule is life-giving and life-sustaining. The earth comes to the woman's rescue by opening up and swallowing the torrent. Interesting, in the Greek, the earth here is given a female name, Gi. Here we have another Exodus reference, alluding to Pharaoh's armies being swallowed up by the Red Sea. We should have been counting all these Exodus references. Revelation 12, 17. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. I like that illustration there. The Bible says Satan is like a roaring lion. He appears to be big and mean, but he's no match to the power of Christ. The dragon's efforts have been foiled, so he turns his anger on the woman's offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. If you didn't know by now, I have a news flash for you. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, if you call yourself a Christian, you are in a spiritual war. Satan is at war with you. Now, when I tell you that, should you be frightened? No. Should you be aware of his tactics? Yes, he certainly should be. The Bible tells us to not be ignorant of his tactics, but it also tells us that we have power in the name of Jesus, and there is no reason for us to fear Satan. So, Keep that in mind. You are in a war. If you call yourself a Christian, Satan is at war with you. As Christians, we are in the world, but not of the world. While we have to live in Babylon the Great, this earthly culture, our home is not here. Our future home is in heaven, but until then, God prepares for us places in the wilderness where we can be nourished, protected, and refreshed. While we live in a place with a counterfeit God, this is not our home. Therefore, as in the warnings to the seven churches, we must keep ourselves from assimilating to the prevailing culture of Babylon. We must resist the temptation to settle down in Babylon and instead continue on our journey to the new promised land. Revelation is the story of a world in disarray that needs messianic repair. Everything is out of kilter and needs to be put into proper place. When Satan is cast out of heaven in chapter 12, order is restored in the world above. But conflict in this world intensifies until Satan and his accomplices are sent to their proper place in the lake of fire. Chapter 13 is divided into two parts, each beginning with I saw. The first part details the beast from the sea, and the second, the beast from the land. Remember the reference from 1212, which detailed the third woe upon the earth and the sea. Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him power and his throne and great authority. Like Satan, 
the dragon in chapter 12, verse 3, the sea beast has seven heads and ten horns. While the dragon wore seven diadems on its seven heads, the beast wears ten diadems on its ten horns. Head is a well-known metonym for ruling authority, and horns are symbolic of power. The crowns on the dragon's head suggest that it is the ruling authority, the puppeteer behind the beast. The diadems on the beast's horns suggest that it is the tangible expression of Satan's power on earth. The significant number of fullness, seven heads, and the number of totality, ten horns, accentuate the beast's claim to complete authority and total power. Verse 1 tells us that in addition to the heads and crowns, that the beast also wears a blasphemous name prominently on its head. In the ancient world, names express the essence or character of a person. The beast's blasphemous names signal its self-deifying intention to displace God as the ruling authority of the world. The beast is like a leopard with feet like a bear and a mouth like a lion. These features are a composite of the four beasts described by Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. Those four are often thought to represent four different ruling empires of the ancient world. By combining them into one, it's possible that the beast is representative of all evil empires. And it's common to interpret the sea beast as the Roman Empire. It's true that various emperors claimed to be gods or were declared divine by the Roman Senate after their deaths. But likely the meaning is much larger than that. It's a bigger picture of the nature of evil and the self-deifying tendencies of human nature. Revelation chapter 13 verses 3 and 4. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? In 13.4, we have a two-step rhetorical question that interrupts the narrative flow. Who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? This is a reflection of Exodus 15, where, another Exodus reference, in verse 11, after Pharaoh and his armies are buried in the Red Sea, the people proclaim, who is like you, O Lord, o, uh, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? Yet notice the rep uh, repetitive phrase, was given or was permitted in verses 5 through 8. While the beast claims unlimited power, it would have none if it were not given by God, who continues to place boundaries on the beast. And as we mentioned before, while the, uh, the dragon has seven heads and the beast has ten horns, each of them covered with diadems, Christ has many diadems, incalculable, many more, not limited. Revelation 13, 5 through 7. There was given to him a mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. So in these verses in chapter 13, we are seeing that the beast is attempting to imitate the lamb. Look at these examples. In chapter 5, verse 12, the lamb receives the scroll and is invested with authority. In 13, verse 2, the beast receives authority and power from the dragon. In chapter 5, verse 9, the Lamb ransoms saints from every tribe, 
language, people, and nation. Chapter 13, verse 7, the beast receives authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. In chapter 5, verse 11, heavenly creatures give homage to the Lamb. In 13.4, the whole earth worships the beast. And in chapter 5, verse 6, the Lamb appeared to have been killed, but was standing in the middle of the throne. In 13.3, one of the beast's heads appears to have been killed, but was healed. And so you see that in these and other ways, the beast is trying to imitate Jesus. He's trying to imitate the lamb. He's attempting to be Christ-like in order to fool people into believing that he, in fact, is the Christ. In this study, we've talked a good deal about perspective and particularly the difference between the earthbound perspective and God's perspective. From the below perspective of those who follow the beast, it is a godlike being exercising worldwide power and unrestrained authority, including per persecuting the saints. From John's and the reader's above point of view, however, the beast is a counterfeit deity subject to God's inscrutable plan and divine sanction. God is in control and the war against the saints does not further the beast's aims. Evil is conquered by the saint's testimony, even unto death. Christ conquers by his death on the cross, and it is the pattern of the saints also. Well, in the past couple of chapters, we've seen 42 months, 1260 days, and time, times, and half a time, all representing three and a half years. However, John only uses 42 months to describe evil characters, evil's autocratic reign, the beast. Why would that be the case? Well, let's see. 42 is the product of six times seven. Six represents the failure to achieve completeness or perfection, as six is striving towards being a seven, but it just can't make it. Seven is the number of plenitude or completeness. Thus, six times seven would be imperfection striving for perfection, seeking a godlike status, but falling short of the mark. So you only see 42 months in reference to evil characters in Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Okay, let's talk about a little bit of controversy here in 13.8. Um, it's a little bit problematic because of the modifier from the foundation of the world. There have been some who claim that it modifies the names written in the book of life, which would be an indication of predestination. In other words, everything's already been determined before you were born. However, others claim that it modifies the slaughtered lamb, indicating that from the foundation of the world, God's plan included the cross. This second interpretation corresponds to 1 Peter 1.20, which says, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for your sake. So I think the better understanding is that from the foundation of the world is referring to Christ, not those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Part 1 closes with an encouragement to listen attentively. Let anyone who has an ear listen. This is a call for the faithful endurance of the saints. To listen attentively is to actively resist the norms, 
values, and beliefs of the beast in Babylon and to follow the way of the Lamb. Verse 10 indicates that some may even be captured and killed because of their testimony for Jesus, but the saints are called to be faithful. The way God has chosen to, compare, uh, to conquer evil is through 1. The Lamb slaughtered from the foundation of the world and 2. The endurance and faith of God's people. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. So let's talk about the land beast. From the earth arises a second beast having two horns like a lamb, but speaking like a dragon. The two horns mimic a lamb, deceptively making it difficult to distinguish good from evil. Yet his dragon-like voice reveals its destructive nature. As established above, the beast from the sea is the counterfeit Christ. The beast from the lamb is the counterfeit Elijah. Even making fire come down from heaven in verse 13. This trait was also possessed by the two witnesses who are imitated by the land beast with his two horns. Revelation 13, verse 14 and 15. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and had come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. We have mentioned this before in Lesson 2, the beguiling nature of evil. You see, the land beast performs signs on behalf of the sea beast to deceive the earth's inhabitants. Its beguiling nature is one of the strongest traits. Evil deceives people into thinking that falsehood is truth, that worship of the creation is worship of God, and that the penultimate is the ultimate. Its ability to enliven a dumb image is evidence of its compelling speech that convinces people to worship the creation rather than the creator. We've talked about it before. Why do people do bad? They don't do bad because it looks bad. They do bad because they've been fooled into thinking it looks good. And that's what this beast, this land beast, will be able to do. He'll be able to convince people that bad is good. Some have tried to link or identify the land beast to various historical figures. It's also equally likely that the land beast represents any ideology which informs any human structure that seeks to regulate itself independent of God. The land beast may well stand for any religious system which aligns itself with the hostile forces of the world against the faith of Jesus Christ. That's a quote from Henry Sweat, as quoted in Dr. Rezegi's book. Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18. And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number of that is that of the man, and his number is 666. The second beast causes all to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. Christians are warned 
that it is impossible to receive both the mark of the beast and the seal of the Lamb. The word mark occurs seven times in Revelation, always in reference to followers of the beast. While the seal of the Lamb is a spiritual branding that identifies those who belong to the one true God, the mark of the beast is a spiritual imprint that identifies those who belong to the counterfeit God. As the seal protects the saints against judgment, the mark protects the inhabitants of the earth from economic and social ostracism. Everyone is either stamped with the seal of God or the mark of the beast. There is no third option. John explains that the number is a number of humanity or of mankind as 666. While seven represents total or completeness, six falls one short. If the beast represents the bestial side of humanity as it strives for deification or seeks to be ultimate, then six is an appropriate number to represent humanity striving for a godlike status, but falling short. As three generally represents God, the piling up of three sixes represents Satan's effort to mimic and parody God. The call for wisdom in chapter 13, verse 18, is not to look for a, sp a specific historical person or an individual antichrist figure, but rather to understand the deceptive and beastly nature of evil. When humans and human institutions strive to be godlike and demand a loyalty that belongs to God alone, they take on the characteristics of a beast. That's a quote from G.V. Caird from Dr. Rezegi's book. The symbolic meaning of 666 is that it falls short of perfection, but has some of the hallmarks of truth, and so it can easily deceive. It's a half-truth, but it can still look like truth, and it will deceive many people. Before I read this final slide, uh, I want to talk a little bit about recent history. In the year 2020, when the pandemic first came on the scene, there was a lot of talk about vaccines, and there was a concern among some Christians that I had seen that were concerned about taking a vaccine and inadvertently accepting the mark of the beast, like it was going to be a little computer chip inserted in the needle, and that somehow was going to be the mark of the beast. That's not a real true teaching. That's a false teaching, um, because Although there will be trickery involved in the mark of the beast, it's not going to be the gotcha, bait and switch kind. People are going to be genuinely tricked into believing that the beast is God, and so they will voluntarily take the mark. You won't be fooled into taking the mark. People will voluntarily take the mark because they believe that the beast is God. Uh, we see in some places around the world right now that uh, different companies are offering their employees the opportunity to have a little computer chip placed under their skin. And uh, they can have uh, like a bank account on their computer chip and use, the, uh, use their hand uh, to uh, be scanned whenever they buy anything from the vending machines or the company store. And um, I'll be honest with you, I don't think I would do that. That is not the mark of the beast yet but it's a very close uh, likely tool that the mark of the beast will entail. And so um, I would be very cautious about that. Now here's a final reminder. John's call for discernment is to resist both the ideologies within the contemporary culture and the ideologies within the Christian community that encourage compromise and assimilation with the values, norms, and beliefs of the secular culture. We're always under pressure to compromise our values to get along with the culture that we live in. We're being warned not to do that. I want to thank you for joining us for Lesson 7 as we've covered these two important chapters of Revelation, chapters 12 and 13. Once again, my name is Steve Meeker. I hope you'll join us for Lesson 8 
which covers chapter 14 and 15, Mount Zion, the Lamb, and the Harvest. Thank you very much. Have a good day.